you know, sometimes things just tend to take care of themselves. And if you have followed me for very long or know much about me, you know about my opposition to the amount of liquefied natural gas that we want to export out of the country, mostly because it will cause our natural gas prices at home to go through the roof. And we would essentially be subsidizing fossil fuel companies by allowing them to sell our natural resources to countries around the world. And this has been a concern of mine for some time because we've been planning on just building out an enormous amount of LNG export capacity. And our policies are written and executed to make that happen. And this has been a concern of mine for some time. Anytime I'm concerned about something, there's always a little spot in the back of my mind that, that reminds me that sometimes market forces will win regardless of the policy. Sometimes market forces will win regardless of the policy. And no matter how much Donald Trump cancels renewable energy in the United States, no matter how much harm he tries to do to renewable energy around the states, that's not happening around the world. What I'm saying is that's not happening where we want to sell LNG. And people are starting to take notice, finally, that maybe we have too much LNG planned. Because the rapid rate of the expansion of renewables in other countries around the world, specifically places that we would be sending that LNG. LNG has been treated as the future of the global energy security for, for many years now. We keep building terminals, we keep signing more contracts, we keep locking in supply for decades, and all the while, renewables just keeps chugging along. And now something that a lot of people didn't expect is, is becoming more of a possibility. I, I wouldn't call it a reality yet, but I would certainly call it a possibility. A potential LNG glut, which would be really bad for companies that have spent billions and billions of dollars on new LNG export facilities. All of the natural gas demand assumptions that have been made over the last 10 or 15 years are not are beginning to not look like they're going to come to fruition. Not because they missed the mark on how much energy was needed, because it appears a lot of them may have missed the mark on how much renewables was going to be installed making them think a lot more natural gas would be used. There was a great article about this today in Reuters, and that <clears throat> is sort of the inspiration for this <laughs> video. So after Russia attacked Ukraine, LNG immediately became a lifeline for Europe. Europe panicked. Uh, countries all across Europe were, were scrambling for supply and prices exploded. Just a chain reaction of events. You know, governments signed long-term contract, contracts for LNG, whatever cost. And the assumption was pretty simple. We're going to need massive amounts of natural gas for decades. And so tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested in the United States in new LNG terminals. Export, uh, liquefaction, new pipelines. 
But, you know, energy markets, they never stop. They never stand still. This reminds me a lot of the old days in the oil and gas industry. We would make some new discovery. And a lot of us would migrate towards that area. We were somewhat nomadic in that sense. And we would be told, you know, oh, there's 10 or 20 years of, of work here. And it was almost never true. Either the discovery wouldn't be as significant as they thought, or there would be a different discovery somewhere else, or demand just wouldn't justify our existence there. It just never seemed to work out. It's only worked out. Um, a couple of times in my life in the industry, and that was in the Bakken and in the Permian. Every other place that I've been told that we were going to be at for 20 years, two years later we were gone. So we're, we're getting into this scenario with LNG, and I'm not saying that's the thing with LNG, but what's happening is supply is coming online much faster than demand. That's really the core problem. LNG, for whatever reason, comes online in like big waves all at once. There's a lot of projects that are nearing completion that started during sort of the crisis years, you know, 22. Exports are ramping up very quickly now. And what this means is that we're basically sort of flooding global markets and warm temperatures globally are not helping in that matter at all either. Growth in demand has, has stalled. And the thing about LNG, you know, prices for natural gas have to be really high to justify it. That's, that's the whole thing. But the real story is that renewable energy is growing much faster than expected, especially in places like Europe, where we want to sell a boatload, many boatloads of LNG in China as well. And China is the world's largest LNG buyer. A lot of people try to downplay China's renewables you know, they're like, what's the big deal? It's only a third of their energy power generation. I'm like, what? You know, I mean, look at how many people live in China, the size of that country, how much power they use. The fact that they've been able to make renewables a third of their power generation in, what, 20 years? is unbelievable. The United States could never do that. That's not a thing. It's not. People don't realize how big these, and, and you know, when you talk about politics, you know, Republicans and Democrats were screaming about renewables. You know, Republicans have made you believe that we were going to be on renewables overnight. No. No, this is like a 50 or 60 year thing just to get us, you know, halfway there. Like this is, <laughs> you're talking about changing the entire energy foundation of probably the largest industrialized power consuming nation in the world. That is, you know, that's not something you do overnight or over 10 years, or over 20 years, or, you know, that's a lifetime. But, you know, the war on renewables in the United States may help natural gas demand at home, but the whole point of LNG is that we don't use it here, we export it. That's the point of it. Europe has reduced their gas demand structurally. They've installed an enormous amount of renewable energy. Uh, 
making huge strides and efficiency gains. And this is just nonstop because they're not actively trying to destroy it. But this is, is going to have or could potentially have a, a large, like a, a massive impact on LNG investors in the United States. The long-term demand curves for LNG seem to be flattening. And I'm not saying this is the death of LNG. It's, it's certainly not. But it's really good news for people in the United States if we can't export as much LNG as we want. It's our only hope, really, keeping natural gas prices in the United States in check to where they're not more aligned with global markets. LNG only works if the utilization stays really high, if the long-term contracts stay in place, and of course, the prices remain high and supportive. When you have an oversupply of LNG in the global market, it's just like having an oversupply of anything in the United States. You get much lower prices, and LNG is very sensitive to prices. It's, they've got to be high. Uh, as soon as that happens, all your contracts are, you know, they're demanding to renegotiate contracts. Current projects could end up just being stranded. Much weaker returns on investment, which means much less investment in the future for future projects. LNG is extremely capital intensive, much more than oil. And, and there's no flexibility there. Once you build an LNG terminal, you're stuck with an LNG terminal. There's not a lot of things you can do with that. If you have a giant fund for oil and gas exploration, that's very flexible because you can do that exploration anywhere in the world or you can reroute those investments into better things. But once you have an LNG terminal, you're stuck with it. Good luck selling it. And this is why I say, sometimes I worry too much about policy. The markets just take care of it. We were sold a bill of goods on LNG. I fought it the entire way. And it's, to be clear, it's not that I don't support LNG. It's not even that I have a problem with us exporting it. It's just the amount was insane. And that's because there was things involved in that that were much greater than just meeting energy needs. This is where politics and energy collide. The whole point of us supplying the world with LNG was about geopolitical control and leverage. In addition to billionaires making many more billions. So by no means is LNG dead, but the narrative narrative is pretty much dead. So the growth is, is likely to slow down a lot. The margins are going to get tighter. And maybe there's a glimmer of hope that it won't be as bad as I've thought it was going to be. Because before now, the need for LNG was unquestioned and unlimited, and we were just going to go all out. And natural gas still matters, of course. It's a, a huge deal. And it's very beneficial to us. But it no longer owns the future by default, right? So renewables hasn't killed LNG. It just... They just changed the math of LNG. And the math is everything because the math is the dollars. And this is traditionally 
what always happens. This is a classic energy cycle. Energy markets and investors always overreact. First, they overreact to scarcity, then to abundance. And LNG is definitely entering its abundance phase. So the danger is building a 30-year infrastructure project for a demand curve that may peak and decline much sooner than they initially thought. And that's where your money's at. Money, money is counted on the demand curve. And it's also a sign that the global energy you know, system is changing more rapidly than we thought. Even if it's not happening in the United States, it's happening. Happening around the world. So we'll see. We'll see how it works out. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. Really appreciate all my new followers and subscribers. Please like and share. Let me know your thoughts. You guys have a great week.